Now unto the Dark Prince's realm. I prepare to enter his realm, expecting to encounter guardians who would seek to tear into me with talons and fangs. At the least, I assumed I would find bastions to bar my progress. I found none. The land before me was open and pristine. Its fields shimmered like gold, and its forests bore fruits of sapphires and emeralds. I took a step into this place, and instantly knew I was lost just as surely as if I had been impaled on a debtor's spike. From the heretical tome, the confessions of Cardinal Wogolta. Slanesh is unique among its brother gods. It does not try to keep others out of its home in the realm of chaos, the Dark Prince's realm. It invites them in. Through a series of tests, it defends its gleaming palace against assaults. Tales such as that of the heretic Cardinal Bogolta Describe this palace of Slanesh, also known as the Palace of Pleasure, as sitting at the center of the Dark Prince's empire, surrounded by six other domains arranged in concentric rings. Each ring holds different temptations for those who wander through it, imploring them to succumb to the pleasures it offers. Temptation is a weapon just as powerful as a chain sword or boulder. Traps can be sprung to eliminate the weak and dim. The bodies of those who succumb to the myriad temptations of the Dark Prince's realm are consumed by the land itself, or turned into statues that beautify the view for others. The souls of these lost and damned unfortunates feed Slanesh's insatiable hunger. It invites them in so that they might sustain the god and its realm. Those who pass early tests may catch its eye, giving it some amusement for a time as it watches them resist, only to inevitably lose themselves to one seduction or another. Those rare few who make it to the outer walls of the Palace of Pleasure may be graced by a visit from the Lord of Excess itself. None have ever made it into the palace unless Slanesh wished it, for all who have looked upon the gods' perfection have fallen to their knees and given themselves over, mind, body, and soul to its dark majesty. The Excess of Riches The Ecclesiarchy uses stories of wayward souls like the heretic cardinal to try to warn their servants of the dangers of temptation, drawing from the crazed descriptions of the Dark Prince's domains and minions that are related in such tales. It matters not if these accounts have any basis in real experience, or if they are purely mad ravings brought on by fever or drugs. Real or imagined, they are powerful tales for protecting the simple-minded from, among other things, dreams of wealth and the pleasures it can buy. In the first of the rings of the Dark Prince's realm, day turns to night, and the golden hues are replaced by soft blue. The sky shimmers ceaselessly. The heavens are filled with diamonds that seem as if they could be plucked from their place in the sky 
if one could but reach just a little further. Indeed, many try to do just that, forgetting themselves as they do, not paying attention to their surroundings. Higher and higher they reach, climbing trees made of pure gold, even leaping from the bars, only to plummet back to the ground, fracturing skulls and rupturing organs when they crash. The end comes to them then, but it is a joyous one, for in their minds they see only handfuls of glittering jewels. It is a temporary joy, however, in exchange for a fleeting moment of false elation, they forfeit their immortal souls. Scholars of the Ruiner's powers collate tales of the impossible realms of pleasure and pain, and often describe the first of Slanesh's treacherous domains as confronting visitors with a spectacle of riches beyond the wildest dreams of even the most avaricious merchants. They tell of the trees, grass, and other plants made from living gold. Gentle breezes cause the grass to shimmer like the waters of an ocean under a noon sun. As the wind passes over the blades of grass and through the branches and leaves of the trees, it takes on a voice that beckons all to take as much as they want and more. The mountains that rise up on the horizon reflect a glorious warm light, letting all who see them know that they too are formed from gold. Pathways through the fields are paved with cobblestones not of granite or shale, but of ruby and emerald. At the edges of the paths, loose gemstones and gold nuggets sit, waiting for anyone to pick them up and slip them in a pouch. There is always room for one more glittering stone, one more pebble of gold. Wandering souls ensnared by this domain would do well to recall the legends that say that if those who lined their pockets with these treasures were able to take their eyes off the objects of their desire, they would note that not all they see was shining. Dull bits of bone and other remains are plentiful here as well. These are all that is left of those who fill their pockets, pouches, sleeves, and boots with so much gold that they collapsed under the weight of it, unwilling or unable to let the riches go. They died where they fell, smiles on their faces despite their impending ends. Next, the excess of sustenance. Mad ravings from those who claim to have seen into the beyond say that if an intruder is able to pass through the ring of golden fields without succumbing to greed, he is next confronted with a lake so vast its shorelines fade to nothing in the distance. The only other land to be seen is a smattering of pale islands connected to each other by a network of bridges. The finest wine serves as water in this lake, but no cups wait to be filled. The bouquet of the wine is strong, pleasant, and enticing. Words from fiery sermons begin to fade in the face of such serenity. Most visitors take very little time before they give up on the idea of cups and fall to their knees to drink directly from the lake. Heads swimming with delightful intoxication, many continue to drink until they slip into the waters 
and sink below the surface, never to be seen again. Those who are able to lift their heads from the wine, cast their gaze more closely on the islands and see them for what they are. Hunched giants holding aloft great tables, heaped with extravagant feasts. Exotic fruits, rich breads, and meats of every kind are present. Swimming to these islands is perilous, and many whose senses have become wine addled sink beneath the waves, joining the countless others who have slipped beneath the carmine liquid. For the ones that make it, the reward is astonishing. Each bite is better than the finest meal they have ever experienced. Each morsel is a decadent delight for the tongue. Faster and faster the wayward consume the food. The voracious eater forces handful after handful down their throat. In their blind need to consume, they do not notice that some of the meat comes from carcasses with an all too familiar form. Even if they were to somehow stop forcing food into their own stomach long enough to recognize the fate that awaits them, they could not stop. Given completely over to gluttonous indulgence, the mortal only stops eating when their body fails and they finally collapse into the feast awaiting the next hungry dinner. The Excess of Bodily Delights There is perhaps no easier way to corrupt a mortal than to appeal to their carnal instincts. Entire imperial libraries are filled with tales of lurid corruption on one side and manuals with instructions for fighting it on the other. In his heart, a preacher knows that his congregation is most likely to fall because of the indulgences of lascivious desire than from any other temptation. The Dark Prince surely knows this as well, and it is why the legends say it fills the third ring of its domain in the realm of chaos with visions sense and experiences that overload the mind and body of anyone who makes it this far. Rich fields of pleasingly textured grasses fill this ring, lit with teasing golden hues. Soft tents made of spun dream threads reflect visions gleaned from the deep subconscious of those who gaze upon them, forming sinuous corridors so narrow that a traveler cannot help but brush up against them and feel their cloying embrace. From one vista to the next, visitors travel through a series of decadent tableaus, each more twisted and inviting than the one before it. The crude flesh dens of the underhives or the elegant shadowed parlors of the hive spies cannot present anything close to what the Lord of Endless Delights offers. Demon and mortal bodies entwine until they become one, Forms so beautiful, they are difficult to look at, lie couchant, beckoning, resisting, is all but impossible. The sights and sounds of the offered pleasures are sufficient to enthrall most who see and hear them. The assault on the senses does not end with these things though. The air hangs heavy with an intoxicating musk so rich and pervasive that it penetrates the flesh of all who pass through it, 
quickening the heart and opening the senses further than thought possible. Thus stimulated, flesh becomes hypersensitive to even the most gentle breath of air or tender caress. Scents waft from braziers in which smolder the embers of an incense that triggers memories of amorous encounters of the past. A mortal in this state is easy prey for the purveyors of delights that surround them, closing in on their now willing victims, demonettes offer comforts with softly voluptuous flesh, kisses from razor fang mouths, and embraces from piercing claws. The Excess of Adoration Within the ranks of the militaries of every star-faring species, talk of glory is common. Troops are motivated to achieve more than they believe they can by speeches from commanders who exhort the ranks onward to glorious victory. When battles are won, the returning heroes are held high and showered with praise and adoration. This effect on the hero can be profound. More is possible, he thinks. More can be achieved. More glory can be his. Insidiously, this can also lead to fears of letting it all slip away, of failure and derision. In these thoughts, a path to Slanesh is laid at the feet of the hero. This path is not restricted to the military, leaders of government, churches and cults all seek approval as well. Even fathers want their children to look up to them. The path described in the heretical cardinal's confession is crowded with wayward souls, a path that leads to the fourth circle of the Dark Prince's realm. For each visitor here, the experience is unique, though there are commonalities for many. Massed throngs may greet a soldier, cheering his name and erecting statues in his honor. Planetary governors may see themselves establishing such complete order that they gain control of an entire star system. Whatever the scenario presented to him, the victim of these visions finds it incredibly difficult to pull themselves out of the pleasant dream. Unlike the dreams experienced when a person sleeps, these illusions do nothing to seem impossible. A soldier has seen others elevated and has been trained for acts of glory. Histories are filled with tales of governors who have carved out greater realms among the stars. These and more offer solidity to the visions encountered, drawing the dreamer farther and farther into illusionary depths. Only self-doubt gnaws at some, and these are the ones who break free. When they do, the dream shatters, revealing, if only for an instant, a vast plain of black suit. Upon it, heaps of bones are buried beneath the bodies of millions of others, standing and lying in the burned ashes, still trapped in their individual delusions. The unsettling image flashes by in an instant, and the traveler is confronted by the traps of the next circle. The Excess of Achievement when the god emperor of the Imperium created the Space Marines, legend has that he faced the difficult task of engineering a warrior that was eager to serve him through great deeds of heroism and by achieving the impossible in his name. At the same time, these soldiers needed to be humble enough to realize that victory earned in the name of the emperor is not personal. 
that they are simply weapons to be wielded in his hands, unquestioning and obedient. As is known to those who have studied those ancient times, he failed. Legions rebelled, led by prideful Primarchs who questioned his plans and thought they could do better. All the while, the Prince of Chaos whispered encouragement in their ears, as it does to all visitors to the fifth circle of its domain, if the blasphemous tales are to be believed. What appears to be a grand forest with dense clusters of majestic trees that house secluded glades is, of course, a trap. The sound baffling effect of the trees puts the mind in an introspective position. The long walk gives it time to wander. The glades are inviting and serene. In the center of each glade is a perfectly still pool that invites the traveler to sit and reflect upon their thoughts. As they stare into the pool, they recall their accomplishments and dwell on what more they could achieve. Sitting there, lost in thought, the undergrowth of the glade begins to creep in on them. Thorny branches reach toward them, strangling vines descend from the trees and gently coil around their neck. As they close their eyes, and imagine themselves striking down legendary foes, conquering galaxy-spanning civilizations, or negotiating heavily favorable warrens of trade. The waters of the pool rise up and take the shape of whatever represents defeat for the dreamer. Sensing something is amiss, the ensnared visitor opens their eyes and is confronted by a vision of shame and defeat just before the branches and vines rip at their flesh and choke the air from their lungs. The sound of their final scream, stifled by a lack of air, is a delight to the Dark Prince. An incredibly small number of travelers resist the temptation to dream and are spared the torment of confronting their failings. They rise exhausted by their trials and pass into the sixth and final circle that stands between them and the palace of pleasure. The Excess of Repose Life in the 41st millennium is hard, short, and brutal. For many, each day is a struggle to simply survive to the end of the day. Even species that do not suffer the oppressive yoke of imperial rule are not without burdens. The Eldari, for example, must ensure that their craft worlds are supplied and ready to repel invaders all the while haunted by the knowledge of the terrible fate that can await them should their souls fall to she who thirsts. Still, bodies need rest. Surely any wanderer who has made it to the last of Sarnesh's defensive rings must be wary, and especially deserving of repose, even if only for a moment. Upon emerging from the delightful torments of the previous five circles, anyone who could resist the seduction placed before them at this point would surely become legend. Awaiting the beleaguered traveler, say the whispers of those depraved riches languishing in perfume palaces and pleasure dens, is a vision of sublime peace. All struggle is surely a thing of the past, all torment a distant memory. Here is a beach of softest sand, warm by the rays of a golden sun. Gentle breezes push scattered clouds through a perfect azure sky. 
music is carried on those same breezes, soothing the spirit. The ground itself rises up and caresses the body of the weary wanderer. Cherubs begin to remove armor plates and burdensome belongings, coalescing from the salted mists of the waves that break upon the shore. Figures with placid features and soothing hands approach and rub tired muscles. The memories of an arduous journey fade into nothingness. Peace is the wanderers at last. It is peace eternal if the will is not strong enough to snap consciousness back to reality. Determination sends the placid apparitions screaming back to the seas. Resolve collects displaced armor and other possessions. Herculean effort forces the few strongest invaders to rise up and approach the final destination. The palace of Slanesh lies ahead, and surely any who could pass through the six trials is prepared for what awaits. And at last, the palace of pleasure. A determined warrior, demon or mortal, who survived the predations of the six circles of the Dark Prince's realm and their inhabitants would naturally assume that the palace of pleasure, Slanesh's residence and seat of power, would be defended with legions of demonettes and fiends. Surely his keepers of secrets would confront any invader that made it to the Dark Prince's abode. Thick walls must surround the grounds and towers of his demands. Slanesh has no need of such defenses, however. Any invading force, from a lone space marine to legions of bloodletters, would find that the only guardians present would be the statues of the finest alabaster and perfectly shaped trees. Confused as these warriors might be, nothing could prepare them for the presence of the master of the realm. As the invaders contemplate what they perceive as a lack of defense, the air stills. Unseen choirs sing, and ears weep at the unholy harmonies. A god emerges from his palace, striding confidently toward the awestruck invaders. The dark prince smiles. It is enough to completely disarm any who stand in its presence. They are lost, and they care little of the fact. This, the tales say, is why there are no defensive walls or demonic hordes around the palace. There is simply no need. Resistance in the face of perfection is not a possibility. What becomes of those thus ensnared is beyond speculation, and more the subject of fevered dreams. Not one soul has trod upon the ground of the Palace of Pleasure and returned to tell the tale. Scholars of the obscene and decadent debate not only the fate of those who get this far, but even the very structure of the grounds and the palace itself. There being no first-hand accounts, who can say for sure what form the citadel takes? Some say the palace is a single humble dwelling, making the appearance of the Prince of Pleasure even more grand in comparison. Others say it is the most opulent structure ever conceived, stretching four kilometers in every direction, including upward. Most agree that it must be magnificent. A god of excess and perfection must have a domicile to match. If this is correct, then the spires of gold and marble surely ring an inner courtyard wherein statues of exquisite realism are placed. 
These statues might be the final form of those who succumb to the disarming allure of Slanesh. If so, then their faces would bear a countenance of absolute joy. These statues would capture forever the perfect moment of grace that one would surely feel in the presence of perfection. It may be that the only inhabitant of the Palace of Pleasure is Slanesh itself. Perhaps no demons of any kind are required to embellish its inner sanctum. Or it may be that the palace is filled with life, a den of iniquity where decadence unrivaled is played out eternally. Regardless, it is the seat of power for the Lord of Pleasure, the Master of Painful Delights, the Prince of Obsession. It is home to Slanesh.